All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Stewart. I'm with Visual Decisions. I'm here today with a gentleman from uh, Sandalwood Engineering and Ergonomics to talk about a subject that we're all very passionate about, which is human-centered design. Uh, broadly, what we mean by that is how do we put uh, the human at the center of process design, uh, manufacturing, uh, overall design, and so forth. And uh, with me today, I uh, have the pleasure of having uh, you know, distinguished experts um, from Sandalwood. And I'm going to turn it over to Rob Simmons from Sandalwood to uh, further introduce the topic. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so Sandalwood Engineering and Ergonomics, uh, we're a very close partner to Tim and Visual Decisions. And you know, Tim has an unusually broad background in manufacturing. Likewise, with Sandalwood, we're a, we're a bit of an unusual combination. We have three different lines of business, uh, injury prevention and ergonomics, systems engineering, which is very process centric. And then we have systems integration, which is uh, all things digital transformation. So the, our three lines of business, uh, quite a lot, they operate independently in their own disciplines, but on certain projects we're combined as a kind of a, a um, change agent. And when we're working together, uh, our colleagues have talked a lot in the past that, uh, you know, the more you combine our disciplines, it, the more it comes out that the human element is, is the real constraint on these projects. So earlier this year, what we started working on is treating it as a formal discipline and a formal approach. And we put together a cross-discipline team from, from the three lines of business. And uh, today we're going to share with you some of our findings and, and the kind of approach that, that's come out of that process. And two of the people leading that team and that multidiscipline effort are my colleagues, Carlos Rial and Kyle Pofferman. And I'm going to hand this over to uh, Carlos and let him walk you through the changes. Thanks, Rob. Uh, good morning. This is Carlos Real with Sandalwood Engineering and Ergonomics. Um, and let's jump uh, right into uh, human-centered design, uh, some background. Uh, so as most of us uh, understand, humans are uh, a key element in, in several transformation and service processes. So, uh, I mean, humans provide flexibility and adaptability uh, which, which is an advantage uh, to say manufacturing systems. However, humans, uh, I mean, from the perspective of their capabilities and limitations, uh, we, need, we need to consider them uh, when we, we actually design the, uh, the system, say a production system. Um, so we, we center basically um, those capabilities and limitations with a vitamin physical and cognitive and this is uh, part of, of, of the model that we have developed and how we consider those capabilities and limitations, say constraints as well, uh, to, to design and implement systems. Um, so because uh, Sandalwood uh, is an engineering services company with uh, capabilities, as Rob uh, mentioned, in systems engineering, systems integration, and injury prevention, which, which covers a lot of the human aspects. Um, we have the ability to, to provide uh, a holistic uh, approach. And uh, this is how we develop the human-centered design program, which is, which is a, a formalized concept. Um, and, 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 and actually, it's a solution set um, in the way that we can, can design uh, and implement uh, the systems work where the uh, human will perform the task. Uh, what you're seeing on your screen now is the, uh, the basic model that we develop. Uh, it's, I mean, it comes from the, uh, the, the systems um, uh, basic model with the input process output. And what we, want, what we wanted to, uh, to include here are the, uh, the main elements, right? That you consider typically when you design uh, a system around the human. So you have as many inputs as you can see, information and material, which typically would be the main input uh, to a process. And then uh, in the center, you have the actual process where 
typically uh, the transformation occurs or the main uh, tasks uh, within, within your system. And uh, what we have there is the way we conceive uh, the design of that process. And, and, we, and we go from basic to advanced to ideal uh, level uh, characteristics of, of design of, of the process. And we are going to explain uh, with a little bit more detail how that progress uh, from basic to advanced to, to ideal happens in the, uh, in, 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 in the outlook of, of all of those. And uh, in our model, you can also see the main elements of central motivation, uh, which is a reduction uh, to quality, productivity, and employee health and wellness. This is what our company is about. And, and when, you, when you mix those um, into your process design, the output you expect, uh, which is all the way to the right, is the transformation uh, of a product or, or, or the delivery of a service with no defects, waste, or injury. So that, that's, that's what our model is about. That's what it stands for. And the presentation, uh, which mostly is a background on the concept behind this, is, is the breakdown of that model. So uh, starting uh, from the uh, information, uh, which is uh, one of the main inputs, obviously, to, to the process and to the human, uh, information should be clear and, and available. And uh, something very important is, should be clear and available, but also at uh, the uh, precise uh, timing and amount, right? So people can actually uh, make the right decisions. So, so what you want to uh, stay away from is uh, having the person, uh, say, on the operation, struggling uh, to pull information and, and then have to translate it to uh, useful uh, decision-making criteria. Or uh, on the other end, have an overflow uh, of data and, and information uh, that, say, uh, an operator in a workstation uh, doesn't actually need. Um, so this is what uh, we think when we uh, consider the information flow as part of the key inputs to a process. So uh, maybe to, to elaborate, elaborate a little bit more on information, uh, you, you're going to have different ways to, uh, to have that information flow to the human. And those, and, and those alternatives, I mean, can come as very easy uh, manual um, low technology level uh, solutions like the uh, picture you're seeing on your left. That yellow tag indicates uh, that that operator needs to perform uh, an optional process that not all uh, cycles carry out. So that, that, that flags a signal which is very evident, very easy to identify, and he would pull that yellow card and then do the operation. And then to the right, you have uh, more um, high-end uh, tech solutions like augmented reality, right? Which will also provide the information to the human, but in a different way and help him uh, make the decision. Now, uh, moving uh, to the next input, which is material, uh, similar uh, to information actually. So amount and timing would be key variables uh, when we're talking about material as, as the other key input, right? So. Um, in a similar fashion, so material flow uh, should be designed in a way that uh, for once minimizes uh, inventory levels, but the other important consideration uh, for the human is that um, we, we need to provide uh, mechanisms to pull uh, material to the process, and, and those should be clearly identified and easy to operate, uh, which is uh, typically what you look for uh, when you're designing an operation. And uh, again, on the other end, you, you can have uh, processes where, where you don't have a streamlined uh, material flow and you're gonna have excessive inventory because we, we typically are gonna be looking for ways to protect the process and awful, not fall short in materials. And so the operator is gonna be asking for more and more uh, raw materials and people from material would typically try to stash as much as, much as possible around the workstation, that's, that's what you don't want to have. So you, you could either have shortages or excessive inventory. And what you want to have is, again, um, material input in a way that the operator can actually ask. And it's easy to identify the trigger uh, mechanisms and the uh, reorder points, so, so on and so forth. So again, here, similar to information, um, solutions may vary. Uh, and and uh, there are different levels 
of say dependency on the human. What you don't want to have again is uh, the operator or the person struggling to get uh, material to his workstation and you can have a wide array of solutions to again, facilitate that uh, streamlined material flow to the, to the operation, which could have different levels of automation or dependency on the human. So again, Sandalwood in this way is a company that is gonna help you design and implement a process that uh, considers a human, right? And leverages, uh, again, the flexibility and adaptability, but also considers a constraint and, and, and help you uh, to eliminate uh, waste. Um, moving forward uh, and jumping right into the process, uh, which is the, uh, the core of our human-centered design model, um, which is typically where, where the transformation happens, right? So uh, our model has been uh, developed uh, through uh, formal uh, research, and uh, we have had the opportunity to apply it to different manufacturing processes uh, with, with actually a very, very high level of success. Of success. Um, so in the bottom, you can actually see uh, what we were explaining uh, as part of the background and how our model is based in a progressive set of, of uh, what we would call process design elements or characteristics, uh, starting from, from basic and then uh, progressing all the way to advanced and then to ideal, right? And the two main axes there would be the cognitive and physical, physical aspects, uh, which, which are the implications to the human. So again, trying to break that down. Um, so the basic level is, is I mean, it, it has to do mainly with creating um, stability in the process. So typically basic level, what we refer to is, is uh, the design of a favorable uh, environment for improving quality, productivity, and, and overall safety employee, employee uh, wellness. So the uh, characteristics or standards at this level are the best known uh, from the people that used to manufacturing uh, environments. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, structured programs and, and audits uh, driven by customized uh, corporate initiatives or industry standards will typically contain a broad uh, spectrum of basic uh, characteristics. So to the right, you can see uh, like stuff related to training or safety are normally basic standards that are outlined in, in any uh, matured uh, manufacturing system. So uh, some examples again, uh, in the different ranges uh, from quality, productivity, employee health and wellness. Uh, you can have anywhere from training, uh, documenting processes. Uh, and, and then, uh, I mean, these this are uh, to give some specific uh, examples, right? Like uh, in the area of quality, say material containers labeled uh, with the ID of the product, right? So that's something that you need to have in a lot of instances. So people from material know exactly where to put material. So that, again, a very basic, uh, for most people, that's uh, what you need to have uh, in the process. Uh, obviously, if you look at productivity, say the operator needs to be able to build a product uh, within a standard cycle, uh, designate a location for materials, and we're going to talk about some examples, so on and so forth. So again, very uh, basic uh, elements uh, also for, for safety and wellness, but this is what we normally capture uh, when we talk about basic characteristics. So again, these are, these are the best known standards and characteristics. And typically uh, a common approach uh, to, to deploy this is, is uh, to have uh, documentation of standards and procedures and, and, and have them in a way that you, you can say to the organization, okay, this is uh, what you need to meet, right? Say uh, manufacturing management systems or production systems are a typical way to, to capture all basic standards. There, there's a lot of uh, what we would call production systems uh, from different companies that would have their basic uh, standards captured, uh, say in manuals or, or procedures, right? And even in assessment tools that you need to go through and, 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 and then get a score or get an idea of a level on where you are in, in basic standards. Um, so I'm gonna let uh, Kyle uh, to talk uh, of uh, an application example of a basic design characteristic of a manufacturing system. So Kyle, can you please uh, elaborate in a couple of following slides? 
Of course, yeah. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, so as part of the whole, you know, digital transformation, we're seeing a lot of traction being gained in, in the digital tools, um, such as virtual reality, augmented reality, um, and, and these new types of initiatives are really helping to support organizations um, further develop or enhance some of the basic, you know, characteristics, including training. Um, and so, you know, these are examples of how we can take a, some, some training process, maybe it's work shadowing, uh, that's maybe not even meeting basic requirements um, and supplement or enhance that process um, to allow uh, for more efficient um, self-directed learning scenarios. So, um, you know, the old process kind of being shown on the left where someone might reference, uh, you know, a work element sheet, a standard operating procedure, operator a set of instructions, uh, whatever it's called, um, you know, and go through that with someone who's a skilled expert, uh, we can, um, you know, enhance that process by um, allowing them to learn in a digital way. Um, one thing that needs to be considered, though, um, you know, as part of this um, transformation from, from the old process to the new is the, again, the human element. And so we need to consider what, um, what content would be shown and um, exactly what information that the, the new incoming uh, operator would need to see. Um, you know, a lot of times we sort of default to this, well, we have these documented processes, work element sheets, why don't we just put those into the headset? Um, but, you know, considering the human element would dictate, okay, well, who is our audience that's going to be wearing the new headset, the new process? Um, are they capable of understanding, you know, the layout, the formatting of a work element sheet? What is the terminology that's being used? What types of, you know, icons are being displayed in those element sheets? And is it correctly displaying, um, you know, the hazards that might be present in the, in the um, workstation? Is it correctly identifying um, parts in an understandable way, or is it just calling them out by part number because the element she was directed for an engineer. So these are the types of considerations that we're really trying to um, push for um, as we you know, recognize this digital push, this digital transformation to take old processes and bring them new. Those are the types of things that we really want to consider um, you know, as we migrate that process. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. And so I just wanted to give you a bit of an example of how, how beneficial these, these new processes are, are being shown to have. Um, so when compared to traditional training methods, uh, participants that were trained using virtual tools, um, they commit fewer errors, uh, and they also have been shown to take less time in actual product assembly post-training. So that's basically demonstrating that they have a better mastery of the training scenario. Um, one caveat is that it may take longer to complete the training. Um, that was one thing that was found in the study that was uh, published in 2019. Um, although some considerations need to be made, I mean, you know, what was the content of the training? Again, was it, was it effective digital training? Um, because we may take longer to complete the training, but if it's ultimately, you know, resulting in fewer errors, better product assembly, then that new process, um, having a human-centered approach, is uh, proving to be more effective. Um, and just a couple other kind of like um, additional benefits is that um, digital training methods have less waste um, due to you know reduced product assembly, disassembly, those kinds of scenarios where you might have to scrap parts after they've been installed a few times. Um, you can you know repeat a process infinitely using digital tools. Um, you also have access to real-time performance indicator and skills tracking. So from you know a resource perspective, we would better be able to leverage those. Um, technicians elsewhere in the plant if they can complete self-directed learning. Um, and also, you know, your employees are going to learn in these controlled risk-free environments. So um, not having the exposure to hazards, um, whether those are physical or cognitive um, in station as we reproduce these digital methods. But ultimately, the message is that, you know, when we take these transformations and try to try to go after all of these benefits, you really need to consider who your end user is, um, what their cognitive capacity is going to be for um, accepting those training methods um, and making sure your training program is, is well suited for your end user audience. So with that, I'll hand it back to Carlos to take you through the next level of the process. Thanks, Kyle. So uh, moving forward, uh, we would go to advanced level, but just, just before leaving basic, uh, what, we, what we want uh, 
to communicate is how we can help you um, make progress. Even at basic standard level, there's a lot of things that you can do to improve those. Basic uh, does not mean that they're easy or not important, actually are the fundamentals. And as Kyle was explaining, you can take a process as basic as training and, and, and uh, have it improved in, in very different ways. So we've had uh, very good experiences with different customers that we've helped uh, develop uh, and improve, enhance their, their training process, which is again, part of the basic uh, elements that you need to consider and use different tools uh, to get improvements out of that. Um, okay, so moving on to advanced, so uh, different uh, to basic, um, advanced level uh, characteristics uh, will generate continuous improvement by challenging the organization uh, to, to design processes, uh, eliminating risks uh, in our case to quality, uh, productivity and employee health and wellness. So what we mean by this is uh, below is a very simple but illustrative standard. Say when you are at a basic level, you can, you can have standards that say you need to have tools uh, at a designated uh, place within the workstation. Say that's one of your standards and all your uh, operations meet that. Uh, but then when you talk about advanced, uh, you would be more specific in terms of the general goal of waste elimination. And you would say maybe, okay, so our uh, standard now, now that we've met basic is to have all tools within the process, within arm's reach. So the operator doesn't need to say, walk a few steps back and forth. Uh, so again, uh, going back to the basic standard, uh, having tools, uh, in a designated place within the workstation would for sure provide stability and, and predictable results. Say uh, cycle time will always be the same because we have a positive location for that tool. But that does not mean, mean that uh, that position is, is optimal. When you talk about advanced standards to the right, uh, you are actually asking uh, people to think uh, how to drive uh, waste elimination. And then you start looking for ways to get think, things like tools and other stuff closer to the person so, so waste uh, is eliminated. So uh, that would be a very uh, simple way to explain how we move to advance the standards. Say another example, um, application, uh, maybe related to quality. Uh, you have, say, uh, a person within an operation that has optional uh, elements and a, a basic, Characteristic would obviously be provide that person with the information to make his selection and, and say this is, this is a visual display of information when every cycle uh, a screen or a piece of paper is going to tell that person to pick A, B, C, D, or E option, right? And he would read uh, and then conduct his cycle and, and pick, pick the option, right? So this, is, this would be for us, that'll be a basic layout uh, of meeting a standard. And then when you move to maybe advanced level characteristics to the right is uh, using a pick light system uh, to select material. And what that does is diminish, diminishes the, uh, the cognitive burden uh, on the person. Um, we have actually performed some, some actual research uh, on this, which is, which is part of, of what we do and, and, and um, part of my background as a researcher in continuous improvement in, in quality. And we have measured uh, the uh, error rate for these two types of processes. And it's very interesting how uh, in a process like the one on the left, uh, when you have someone uh, reading options and then picking up materials, the uh, average error rate would be around, an average, it has a range depending on the way uh, the, 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 the dynamics and the information and the process, the way you configure it, but it's gonna be around uh, two, errors by, two errors by each 10,000 decisions. So that's pretty much what you can expect. The process to the right when using a pick light, uh, it goes all the way to around 0.2 or 0.3 as an average errors by each 10,000 decisions. So you can see uh, a decrease in the risk to quality of around 90%. And that for us is a clear indication how you progress from basic to advanced. You're not yet at an ideal level because you still have some room for improvement. But again, uh, on our data, we, we can, in a lot of instances, provide the background and how you, you can actually progress from one level to another. Um, 
keeping up and uh, moving to ideal level. So uh, characteristics, when we are at this level, uh, we'll, we'll take the process to what we would call the optimal, the optimum or best achievable uh, state, right? So this is pretty much the way you identify uh, characteristics uh, at the ideal level. So the, the, the elements that you design and implement at this level will, will typically uh, get you in, in terms of output uh, to the uh, uh, to the elimination of defects, waste, or, or, injuries, or injuries, uh to pretty much uh, a level of, of of zero, right? Again, uh, we were trying to line that up: quality, productivity, and wellness. Uh, the same way uh, that we try to connect that with the output. Um, this is an example, and uh, again, a way to eliminate uh, waste to a very good level. This is an operation when, where the uh, the person uh, installs the uh, steering wheel to a vehicle, right? And at an initial uh, stage, that person would have to come out of the vehicle a couple of times per cycle uh, to get the steering wheel, to get the tool, to get bolts and, and, and do the operation. So the fix uh, derived again for looking the ideal level of standards here was to develop this fixture that would get the tool and the material close to the operator. So what you're seeing there is a fixture that, ha that holds the uh, steering wheel installation tool uh, at a support that moves along with the vehicle. And then on the next uh, picture, the one in the middle, you can see how the operator is able to reach out uh, the tool that, that the person uses to perform the, uh, the operation and then, and then how he uses and then, and then would put back the tool uh, where it belongs, right? So uh, steering wheel balls are also in a container, in a container that's uh, within uh, the reach of his arm. And, 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 and then uh, you would have, uh, again, an illustrative example on how you can actually apply uh, these type of concepts. And, and, and the difference here is that you are actually eliminating uh, risks uh, to productivity in a way that you actually are saving a lot of time on walking and going back and forth, say, to get the tool, to get materials. You're also eliminating risks um, to health as well, because you can generate uh, an ergonomic condition uh, on the people going in and out uh, a lot of times uh, during uh, the work shift. And, and again, uh, just a way to think around how to eliminate waste and take our process to what we would call, at least in one of the instances to ideal level. So maybe other application examples would be uh, material kitting uh, for all of us that are familiar with that, which would actually be about uh, pre-selecting uh, pre-picking a lot of material for the operator and having and have it uh, placed, say, in a container or in a way that uh, cycle by cycle, the operator already has only the material that he needs at the time that he needs it. And that would eliminate a lot of uh, cognitive uh, demand. Say, say if, if it's, it's material that needs to be uh, selected uh, and that's, that would be a way to cut risk, say, to productivity and quality. Um, zero gravity fixtures to hold tools, for instance, uh, would help us on productivity and health as well, because we're not exposing the operator to lift, uh, say, heavy tooling and, and machinery. Uh, lifting platforms that would uh, get either material or, or the actual product that we're assembling closer uh, to the human in a way that he uh, would not need to walk farther or make different efforts to reach for, for materials, tools, uh, or, or, or product, right? Um, scanners to read options to select, that'll be a good example as well. That's even a higher uh, progress into uh, error risk uh, reduction. So scanners are, are actually very safe and get you almost to a zero level, level of, of, uh, of error. So again, uh, and this, and this, um, this kind of shows what we're trying to show is how ideal level comes from, from eliminating the risk. Uh, it doesn't have to, go to, to be to all the different uh, elements of the workstation, but at least uh, it should help us eliminate uh, a good portion of the risk, either to quality, productivity, or employee health and wellness. Um, and that's uh, pretty much on, on, on the ideal level. So this is, say, uh, an example of the application, real life application of our, of our model. This is a customer, an appliances uh, customer that has a, actually a worldwide uh, footprint uh, of products. And we're helping him uh, 
design and implement his his production system and and see how the, the base is is pretty much a human centered design because they do have uh, to a good extent uh, processes that are uh, operator uh, dependent. So we we saw this as a very good fit, and we are actually putting a lot to, uh, putting together the different elements that that we want to include as well. So uh, again, this this is going to be the base model, and then we're going to go inside and develop each uh, of the elements and create uh, the manuals that we were explaining and deploy them to cover all basics, and then and then start defining the rules on on and the expectations and the guidelines to design advanced and ideal level of operations. Anyways, we wanted to share a, a little bit of what this actually translates uh, to, at least uh, at an initial uh, stage. So uh, with this, I'm gonna uh, turn back to Rob Simmons uh, to do final comments and, and remarks. Uh, Rob. Thanks guys. So for Sandalwood, this has been sort of a, a natural outgrowth of two of two kind of organic trends. I think for all of us in manufacturing, our, our customers and those of us that, that take care of manufacturers, we all are aware of just the steady march to more automation. Uh, it, every, there's always more velocity pressures on every plant. And so as manufacturing gets uh, smarter and those demands come, it's just naturally, we're all aware, it's naturally pushing uh, that human constraint to the forefront. Um, and likewise, uh, as you see our, our lines of business at Sandalwood, this is just sort of a, a natural um, sweet spot for our company. And it, this is, I think for a lot of us in manufacturing, you know, a lot of things on the surface make sense. A lot of disciplines that we've invested um, and practice, uh, such as Tim with Lean and, and, and our three lines of business. So on the surface, you can say it's common sense. It's quite another thing to turn it into a formal practice and you know, checklist and discipline. What's funny is, is Kyle and Carlos have done this, even in my work in systems integration, it's kind of gotten in my head and I find myself going back to Carlos's uh, pathways that, that he, he lines out. But um, you know where we're going with it is, is as always to serve our customers better and to further manufacturing. Uh, so hopefully you got a taste of that today. Um, and uh, Tim's gonna field any questions if there are any from uh, today's attendees. And uh, we'll be following up with, with uh, the, the folks who signed up to see if there's any follow-up anybody wants after the webinar. And we very much appreciate your time and appreciate our host uh, for for having us on today. Oh, well, I want to thank you guys for uh, coming on uh, my weekly webinar series and uh, sharing you know all of this information about human centered design. Uh, the Q and A um, is available uh, if if anybody wants to ask uh, a question. I've gotten a couple uh, questions, uh, uh, Carlos. Uh, the first is, um, why is including the human important? You know, if you're looking at process, um, you know, optimization overall, um, you know, typically in manufacturing, you know, we think about, um, you know, just optimizing the process and eliminating waste and so forth from a lean perspective. So, uh, you know, to me, you know, this question of why is the human important um, it seems obvious to us just, you know, from a, you know, moral perspective and so forth, but uh, can you explain why it's important from, uh, you know, a business perspective to keep the human at the center of the process? Sure, Tim. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, as you're saying, we typically see uh, process uh, optimization from the perspective of waste elimination, and we consider different aspects, right? Like uh, performance uh, of equipment and the uh, quality of uh, say inbound material and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and we talk about uh, productivity and process flow as well. Uh, we consider uh, again, how, how well the uh, material logistics area is performing and delivering on-time material. 
and, and again, this is kind of the typical approach and, and, and the efforts that the organization uh, makes is, is to, to, to eliminate uh, problems on those elements, but it's not rare to overlook uh, the human as one of the key sources of variation uh, to the process. And, and, and that's a reality, right? So as we were explaining, and this is what human-centered design is about, you need to consider or to work around uh, both the limitations of the human and also the, uh, to leverage the advantages that the, the, that the human provides. So human-centered design is, is uh, I mean, it's a way to look at that variable that we consider the one that is uh, the most uh, important, just because you, you, you can actually, uh, without knowing, uh, put your process in a very high risk to, to the different key aspects that we were mentioning, quality, productivity, and obviously, and obviously safety. If you, if you don't uh, start uh, when you're designing your process on saying, okay, so my, my main piece is the human and, and, and I need to consider and to understand um, how that's gonna work if I, if I look at that as a main element, as a constraint, and again, as an opportunity to leverage say flexibility and adaptability, so on and so forth. So again, uh, for us is uh, making the human, uh, putting him at, at the center of the process uh, in a way that we will not uh, overlook uh, the, the implications of, of having a person uh, performing the task. Okay. Um, just a comment from myself here. Um, you know, I've done a lot of presentations about um, quality, just as an example. And, you know, if you do a typical, you know, fishbone uh, diagram on quality, you break that down into, uh, you know, the different causes of variation um, that can lead to quality issues. And uh, you go with machine, man, method, et cetera. And um, a lot of the common causes of variation are due to the machine and uh, you know the inherent variation within the machine, but um, a lot of the special causes of variation uh, that are you know one time or you know kind of exceptional events and so forth are much more human related. And so you know for me, uh, a big part of the focus you know on the human as a part of this is uh, we have a lot of tools in you know Lean Six Sigma et cetera to address uh, those common causes of variation and minimize those as much as possible. But uh, those tools aren't as applicable to, you know, the human sources of variation. And so having the uh, human-centered design process, to me, helps el eliminate a lot of those different sources. Uh, would you agree with that? Am I on, on target with that? No, yeah, totally. Thanks, Tim. Uh, you, yeah, I totally agree with you. And uh... That, that, is, that is what human centric is about. We understand uh, the, the variation uh, that, that will come out of a, a human centric process, right? And, and then to anticipate all of those, because at the end, you're, you're, you're hitting the nail there. Um, variation coming from the human is, is very wide. So you can have uh, something that's interfering with a process that is affecting the human and the way that is going to reflect uh, can vary from anywhere from a defect, uh, from a line stoppage uh, to an accident, right? But the source might be the same. I mean, the way it affects the human and the output is so unpredictable that you actually need to understand and be proactive in the way you design your process. So you, you can actually have that level of control because uh, otherwise you're gonna see pretty much what you're explaining, uh, uh, special causes that look special on the surface, but, 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 but the actual, uh, uh, variables that are affecting the human might be might be common, and you need to understand those to be able to design a process which will prevent variation from from the human as much as possible. Excellent. Uh, we have one other question, which is, um, what is the best way to start making progress from basic to advanced? Yeah. So from experience, we could say uh, basic. We we can uh, pretty much box them in as uh, specific elements that you need to fulfill. Uh, we were talking about examples. So say, yeah, the operator needs to be trained following this, 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 and this process with uh, so much uh, cycles of the operation. Uh, you can talk about 
uh, yeah, so uh, what we were explaining, like levels, labels of materials should be placed on the boxes of materials so you can identify so on and so forth. So they're very specific. And when you talk about a, a advanced level, you are basically setting up challenges to the organization. So you're not saying what it is that you need to comply in a specific sense, but you would challenge the organization by saying, okay, so the uh, uh, workload of the operator should be a minimum, say of 80%. Like there's research that's, that shows how low workloads would actually result in the operator getting distracted, right? And, and, and then there's a sweet spot. You, you wouldn't want to go say uh, above uh, 95% in a, in, a, in, a, in a process that has a cycle of, of around one or two minutes because then that's gonna create uh, uh, additional stress to the operator, right? So, so you would challenge the organization to look uh, say for that sweet spot and let them come uh, with solutions that, that would uh, get the organization to that level. That's what you evaluate. So, so again, uh, from our experiences, you design guideline, guidelines uh, for advanced uh, level in, in, in rules for designing processes. So we, we can, we actually have a lot of examples of that and the follow-up uh, sessions are gonna be around maybe more specific uh, examples and how you progress from ideal to advanced, I'm sorry, from basic to advanced to ideal. And we're, we're gonna be able to show um, uh, with more detail how that progress um, uh, comes into practice. I'll, I'll jump in here too for a quick second here. This is Kyle again. Um, so putting a putting a little bit of representation from um, our injury prevention group within Sandalwood. So one thing that I think is maybe something that's really important to consider is you know how how robust are your basic processes before um, considering advancement towards you know advanced or ideal and making sure that the process very holistically uh, meets those basic requirements from a lot of aspects. Again, we talked about training is just one particular facet of a, of a really strong basic process. So um, really considering again, focusing back to the human um, and before you know, challenging um, too, many, too many components of your process to try and achieve the advanced level, uh, making sure you've got really, really strong basics um, and, and really just trying to, to build from the ground upward before you get too complicated. So that's just uh, one kind of spin that I wanted to kind of slide in there. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, that's 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 a great input. All right, there aren't any more questions in the Q&A. And so uh, once again, I wanna thank um, Carlos and Kyle and Rob uh, for joining us today. Uh, we'll follow up uh, with the people in the audience to uh, see if you have questions. Um, we'll shoot you an email and follow up with you. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out to us in addition to uh, Rob and Kyle and Carlos. Uh, their emails are right there on the screen. Uh, you can reach me at tim at visualdecisions.com. And um, we'll also make the uh, recording of the webinar available. want to thank everyone again for attending and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you.